Carrie, you have uh, so much experience across private and public sector space. But let's start with Axiom. You know, I, I've attended some of the earlier missions. What does the cadence of the Axiom SpaceX partnership represent for you in the context of commercial space? Thanks, Ed. It's great to be here. This is a really exciting for me. Axiom Space, it's a commercial company. This is their third mission to the International Space Station. It's the first all European crew. So there's a couple of big firsts here. First astronaut from Turkey, uh, first astronaut uh, with the European Space Agency. Uh, Axiom Space is looking at getting into a cadence of about two of these launches a year. And, and again, this is not a government doing this. This is a commercial space company. So if you look at the crew, they are essentially uh, personnel from, from different European space agencies. Um, but Axiom also has this kind of tourism element to it, where a private citizen or civilian, for want of a better word, can, can take a future mission where do you see the most potential? The private sector basically becoming a service for international space agencies or the tourism element? So I would envision their business model is a bit of both. And what's really interesting about what's happening in the commercial space arena right now is, is that it is allowing an increased access to space. So both by nations or foreign governments that maybe couldn't afford or didn't have uh, the technical capability to build rockets and space stations uh, themselves, but also for private citizens. Um, it would have been unfathomable even 10 years ago, say, for this many private citizens to be able to launch into space, spend a, a week or so on a space station. It's, it's pretty amazing. Carrie, are you able to reflect when, at what point, you kind of suddenly realize that SpaceX had kind of changed the game for access to, to low Earth orbit, the human access to space? You know, I'd have to say it's been really within the last couple of years. And let, let's look at last year alone. So SpaceX with their Falcon 9 space launch vehicle, I believe launched, was it 66 times? That's more than once a week. And I come from a community working in the US, US national security enterprise or, gosh, we were talking maybe one launch a month. So the fact that SpaceX is getting down to less than one launch per week is, is extraordinary. Plus, they've announced plans, I think, at over 140 launches is what they'd like to do going into 2024. That's, by my envelope math here, that's two to three launches per week. That is an extraordinary cadence. Now, some of that's human spaceflight, but a lot of that is, is launching commercial payloads, their own Starlink satellites, and then government systems, whether it be U.S. Or, or international. So the question is whether SpaceX is the only game in town now and, and, and for how long. And, you know, a big story in recent weeks has been ULA and Vulcan, something, a launch system which you have some, some history and experience with your reaction to that ULA test? It's been a while coming, so I would like to congratulate ULA for that successful launch last week. You know, one of the things that I think got lost in some of the headlines last week, because there was so much focus on the Peregrine uh, lunar lander and the, the, the issues that they had, um, and, and ultimately now has, has led to a, a failed mission, what was lost in all of that is this was the first time that ULA was now able to to fly an American-made rocket engine. Up until now, they've been relying on RD-180. This is a Russian rocket engine. And it really was Congress back in the 2014-2015 timeframe after uh, Russia invaded Crimea then, it was Senator John McCain that said, hey, we got to get off these Russian rocket engines. We are not going to be lining, lining the pockets of these Russian oligarchs and the government. And so finally, you know, we've seen the development of an American engine, the, the, the Blue Origin BE-4, successfully launch on Vulcan. And that adds to just competition overall, uh, which is, I think, healthy for our industrial base in the space launch arena. Carrie, for the Vulcan and ULA, what would represent progress and success for you this year? You got to get a couple launches under their belt. You know, one launch is good, but they now have to get into a 
a, a good cadence of launches, really prove out that technology. I believe that the Department, U.S. Department of Defense has said, hey, we want to see two more launches before we can fully certify this to launch government payloads. So I'll be looking for repeatability and consistency. And, and I'll say, I mean, that's an area where SpaceX, with their hundreds of launches, they really got that down to a science. So I'd like to see ULA uh, make some progress there as well. Uh, Carrie, we, we really enjoy having you on the program. I, I just ask if you could tell our audience what you've been working on and where the focus of your study and research has been of late. So I lead the Aerospace Security Project here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm a space nerd from early in my youth, uh, so I, I love working these space topics. Some of my big focus areas have really been on space security, the growing with, with the increased commercialization of space, greater use of it for national security, for economic benefit. Um, there are also growing challenges, so the threats to space are increasing. I'm looking at that. Looking at what China is doing in particular, both within their military and national security arena, but they're also making some interesting strides on the commercial front. And you can question whether, well, if it's truly commercial, but they are making some interesting strides there that I've been watching closely.